As the media landscape changes, HBO chairman and CEO Richard Plepler believes that his company is entering a golden age of brand. What people count on us for is the curation of excellence. And what we have to do to continue to grow is keep delivering on that. And delivering on that excellence stems from the people. Our best brand ambassadors are the talent who talk about working at HBO. We can't do better than that. It's this core of talent that Plepler credits for HBO's biggest hits. It's me and you and Silt together. That's the new pecking order. And growing subscriptions with viewers that have more choices now than ever. Our job is play our game. Continue to deliver on what we do. We are making our product available whenever, however, and wherever our consumer, current and future, wants it. Looking back at a 25-year career and forward to what the future holds in this Bloomberg Business Week debrief, a conversation with Richard Plepler. It's coming up to 25 years at HBO for you with the business in a variety of different roles. Tell me why when you look at HBO and you describe what you're doing and this business and all the changes you've seen, that we're now entering, this as you call it, a golden age of brand. You know, there's, there's so much content out there. There's a, there's a surfeit of content, more content now than at any time in the history of our business. There's some terrific content, there's some mediocre content, and there's some not so good content. So I think the truth of the matter is that brands matter now more than ever. And consumers, just look at your own life, you're in the business, you can't follow everything. You know, you hear about a show, you hear about uh, a new series, it's hard to keep up and it's hard to keep track. What you can follow is brands. And you know, I think, and if we're delivering on the implicit promise we make to our consumer, we're delivering on our promise to deliver quality content, to deliver something differentiated, to deliver original voices, to deliver something special to the consumer across a wide range of categories, documentaries, original movies, miniseries, half hours, late night, hour dramas. So I think what people count on us for is the curation of excellence. And what we have to do to continue to grow is keep delivering on that. And I'm happy to say that the great blessing for our company and for our brand is that the best talent continues to want to work with us and inside HBO. So we have this embarrassment of riches where every Friday in our company, we know of something exciting from the creative world that we didn't know about on Monday. And because we understand very, very clearly that the secret to our success are the people that come to work with us, the writers, the producers, the directors, the actors. The magic is out there. And our job is to open our doors and bring in all that talent to HBO to do what they do best. So our best brand ambassadors are the talent who talk about working at HBO. We can't do better than that than to have all those writers and all those producers and actors saying, no, I had a tremendous experience there. I want to do it again. Oh, and by the way, you should go there and do it as well. They're, they're our best brand ambassadors, even better than we are for ourselves. When I was growing up, HBO was one of the few premium outlet subscribers of where you could go to really expect that, that type of programming. Yep. Obviously, during the 25 years you've been there, and the last five years in particular, Hulu, Amazon, other OTT providers, many different choices for this same core group of talent to go try and get projects greenlit, Absolutely. to go other places, Netflix. Do you find that environment is making it, uh, adding to an embarrassment of riches of content? Are you concerned that you're gonna stop getting first dibs on certain projects? How are you out there first with things all, like Big Little Lies, look, for example? First of all, I've never thought that this was a zero sum game. I've never believed that because the crown is a good show on Netflix, that that somehow diminishes Westworld or Big Little Lies uh, or True Detective. It doesn't. It just means there's an additive amount of quality out in the landscape. Our job is play our game. Continue to deliver on what we do. I say over and over again, what we, our North Star is 
let's make sure that we're guaranteeing that the consumer is not only getting the best quality of content inside the HBO uh, offer, but that we are making our product available whenever, however, and wherever our consumer, current and future, wants it. And that's why we built a multilateral distribution strategy, and that's why we're continuing to stick to the core values of the way we think about the creative process, which is come in here and do great work. And for us, the metric is quality. And we think that if we stick to that and we adhere to that, talent recognizes it and it becomes a virtuous cycle. And that, fortunately, we're seeing over and over again. With all of these options that are available to talent and to consumers, the line at our door as we sit here today in the fall of 2017 is longer than it was five years ago and much longer than it was 10 years ago. So, if we continue to execute, and that's our job to continue to execute, because believe me, if we don't deliver on that promise, then you're absolutely right. There is that people are going to turn and go elsewhere. But I think the reason we're growing is because we are delivering on it. When you talk about HBO now, there's two words that come up quite frequently, two phrases. One is multilateral distribution. Second is traditional ecosystem. Yep. Now, when we look at uh, obviously, there's the midst of a deal going on with AT&T buying Time Warner, of which HBO is, of course, a part. When we think about the traditional ecosystem, you've always said that you believe that HBO's growth will continue to come mostly from the traditional ecosystem, that meaning cable subscription, audiences, and licensing. What, what I've said was we are going to grow multilaterally. And what I meant by that is We've, we looked out at the market four or five years ago, and we realized we were totally underpenetrated, and that at about a third of the country, we could do much better than that. And when we made the decision to build our standalone streaming service, we decided, remember at that time, there were only probably five million broadband-only homes. When we stood on the stage in Cupertino, to announce in the March of 2015, there were probably eight and a half to 10, and as you and I sit here today, it's close to 20. So we, we knew that that audience was growing, that cord cutter audience was growing. On the other hand, we knew we were underpenetrated in our traditional ecosystem. So our job was to design deals that incentivized our traditional partners to grow and package HBO, because we saw a lot of growth in that market, and to make sure we provided an option to our consumers that they could get HBO if they only had a broadband-only service. Both. And we knew it wasn't going to be cannibalistic, we knew it was going to be additive, and I think we've been proven correct. When you look at it not being cannibalistic, yes. your own stats show that it's very low in terms of people That's who correct. take away from the core HBO That's business. That's correct. Because there are some people who prefer a traditional bundle and maybe it's a skinnier bundle and it doesn't have uh, you know 180 channels in it but for HBO skinnier bundles have been a good thing because if you take the average price of a cable or a satellite or a telco subscription down from a hundred dollars to say 65 or 70 dollars that means HBO which has always been a la carte right is a much more digestible purchase for somebody off of a lower price point. So for us, skinny bundles have been a good thing. It's allowed the cable satellite telco operator to package us more effectively and opportunistically for us. And at the same time, we've been able to parallel process and to grow digitally. One has not been at the expense of the other. And as I like to say, nobody is selling HBO, whether it's digitally or whether it's in the traditional ecosystem, doing a favor to us. They're selling HBO because it's a great product and it helps keep their bundles stickier and because they know that their consumers want it. When you look at HBO now, where do you see the audience going and what have you learned that's been surprising about that product? Listen, we designed our OTT strategy because as I said a minute ago, we understood and it didn't require too much rocket science to know that that cord cutter group was going to grow. Remember, we were only in about a third of the country and our research was pretty clear to us when we undertook it about two and a half, three years ago, and we saw that we had an additional 20, 25 million homes. As long as you explain to what we call the undecided voter, the persuadable voter, what was inside the HBO package, because people didn't know. You needed to explain to them that there's a library of 3,000 hours of programming, that we have four Hollywood movie studios, in addition to our terrific 
original programming, and you needed to remind people that HBO Go, which was off of a traditional script, subscription, meant you could get HBO on whatever device you wanted. As you began to socialize that, and as our partners began to market that more effectively and efficiency, efficiently, we began to see a tremendous subscriber uptick. And you saw our third quarter numbers, which is 12% subscriber revenue growth. We're on track to have our biggest year of uh, subscription revenue growth in the history of the company. So I think we've been proven right. Great product made available how, when, and where consumers want it and make sure you're available throughout a multilateral distribution strategy. That's how we think about you know, when we current, our current strategy and about the future. We were sitting here months ago, this probably wouldn't have come up in this way, but the AT&T Time Warner deal has hit some headwinds. Mm -hmm. Looks like it may end up in court. Are you still confident the deal will go through? Yeah, you know, look, I, I read what you read, um, and, and I think, you know, obviously there's been a delay. There's discussions between uh, AT&T and the Justice Department. Um, the uh, CFO of AT&T said last week, I think that it's unlikely the deal closes this year, but I, I think we'll get there. And I think the same um, reasons that the deal is dynamic and exciting uh, before all this are still the reasons that the deal is dynamic and exciting. Um, you know, vertical uh, mergers um, have been approved for 40 years for a reason. And um, I think it's exciting for HBO. I think it's exciting for the other two divisions. And I think it's exciting for AT&T as well. So I, I'm optimistic about it. Coming up, Plepler describes what it's like to say goodbye to one hit and how he finds the next one. I remember saying over and over again in 07, there'll never be another Sopranos. What they'll be is the next terrific show. That's ahead on Bloomberg Business Week Debrief, a conversation with Richard Plepler. talk about original programming versus movie distribution and first run, were you surprised that so much of the media focuses on the original programming, yeah. the Game of Thrones, the stuff that's created exclusively, the stuff that wins the kind of awards you guys have won? But the number of penetration in terms of movies is still so high yeah. and so much of the driver. Were you surprised that people didn't seem to be aware of the full package that HBO well, had? Well, the, the consumer, you know, if you look at viewership, 79% on, on, our, on their linear channels are watching movies and somewhere around 72% across all platforms. So movies continue to be an incredibly popular So Even people who have seen a movie in a theater are watching it a second time or even a third time on HBO. And we have, you know, four terrific Hollywood studios, first one pay window movies. That's a big additive piece of our offering. And again, we're starting to market our movie advantage more aggressively than we had in the past, just to remind the consumer how many great movies are on HBO, in addition to the library. You can go back and watch The Wire. You can go back and watch Sopranos. You can go back and watch Sex and the City. You know, there's a whole, if you missed Big Little Lies, go back and watch it. it you know, if, if, you, if you missed True Detective, go back and watch it. Catch up, get familiar with the product and the show, come back to the next season or the next offering. So on demand, tremendous advantage. It came, remember, to HBO first, and now the beauty of all of our streaming services and the optionality that they present to the consumer, huge advantage for, for uh, the, the variable options that consumers have. So you mentioned The Sopranos, and when I look back at, when I go back to 2007, and you're named co-president in charge of programming, and The Sopranos is ending, and Sex and the City is gone. And in Hollywood, people are saying that HBO is over. New York Times. Saying, <laughs> but when, when I w was privileged enough to uh, be given that uh, job, the New York Times ran an article by my friend Bill Carter, for whom I have enormous respect, and said HBO's competitors say they've stumbled. And I always like to say the piece hurt for three reasons, right? It was written by the Times, which I have a lot of respect for. It was written by uh, a tremendous reporter, Bill, who I have equal respect for. And there was some, tr some truth to it. We had, because I think we had become a little hubristic. Um, 02 to 05, I think we, 02 to 07 rather, I think we, um, we rode that Sopranos, Sex and the City, 
uh, Tiger and we thought, well, we had the secret sauce. And I think we lost a little bit of our insurgent voice, which we had brought to the dance uh, for so many years. And I think the job of my colleagues and myself, I uh, hardly did it alone, uh, was to refocus on that insurgent voice, to trust the writers and the auteurs who were coming in with new ideas. And to remember, I remember saying over and over again in 07, there'll never be another Sopranos. What they'll be is the next terrific show. And let's just go back to our essence, which was trusting the voice of great artists and auteurs who have a vision for what they want that show to be. And in came Alan Ball with True Blood, and Lena Dunham with Girls, and Armando Iannucci with Veep, and, and Mike Judge and Alec Berg with Silicon Valley, and these two guys, of course, who had never done television before, um, David Benioff and Dan Weiss, who had this idea to adapt George R. R. Martin's uh, books. And we believed in them, and we trusted them, and we thought they were special. Uh, and you could feel it, and you could feel their passion in the room. And people always say, oh, that you know, was such a brave thing. Well, it actually wasn't, because if you sat with David and Dan, and you saw the way they owned their brief when they were talking about what they thought Thrones could be, it was actually quite easy. When you saw the first cut of Thrones, did you know right away that it was going to be? Well, I think the honest truth is that anybody who tells you that when they see the first cut of anything, they know that it's going to be a mega hit is... is is lying to you. Nobody knows that. Bill Goldman famously said, nobody knows anything. There's a lot of truth to that. What we knew is that something special was possible and that we believed in these guys to tell the story, that they were breathing um, the story of George's books and that they, they lived it. And you, you could feel that. So we placed our faith in them and an extraordinary team that they built around them and that was well placed. In terms of the back end and the tech yeah. of building out HBO Now, yeah. that was a bit of a rocky Yeah, So road. look, the dig on us when we, anno we announced our uh, plans and an investor conference in October 2014. And we said, I think the phrase I used from the stage was HBO's going to go beyond the wall, uh, to coin a <laughs> phrase. and. Um, when, when we all went up on stage, Kevin Suchahara from Warner Brothers, John Martin from Turner, and, uh, and Jeff Bukas, the chairman of, of Time Warner, the first question was to me um, from the eminent uh, analyst, Rich Greenfield, and essentially it was a question which crystallized the implicit um, doubt about what we could do, which was, where's your tech DNA? How are you possibly going to be able to do it? And of course, even if you can do it, won't it become cannibalistic? And we said, I said, yes, we can, and no, it won't. And our tech team, um, uh, which was absolutely extraordinary, which we built from a standing start uh, over the course of the last you know, three, four years in Seattle, which has been nothing short of Herculean, and then we joined up uh, with BAMTAC um, to, to, to you know, help us uh, with our back end. That was a very turned out to be a very wise decision mm. because they were terrific partners, extremely helpful to us. And uh, we made it work. And uh, we were able to push the switch in, in March of 2015 and launch HBO Now uh, with, with Apple. And we've seen tremendous uh, acceleration uh, since then. So no, there, you know, look, none of this is easy. And there were, I would be lying to you if I didn't say uh, there weren't uh, my fair share of sleepless nights. and. Uh, I'm sure many of my colleagues shared those, but we got it done and we're very proud of it. Coming up, how telling the right story can impact someone's life. Those of us who are privileged enough to have a small role in popular culture have an opportunity to tell stories. You can do something that opens up people's eyes. That's ahead on Bloomberg Business Week Debrief, a conversation with Richard Plepler. We've seen a wave of harassment claims uh, in, obviously, in Hollywood. People that HBO has collaborated with, Harvey Weinstein, Louis C.K., across the media industry and politics. You've been in this business a long time. What's been your reaction to it? What 
are you doing at HBO? What have you done? And is this a game-changing moment, you think, for yeah. women in this industry? I think if there's a silver lining in any of this, it's that it is, of course, it will be, it will be a demarcation point in different cultures and companies where willful ignorance or turning a blind eye to questionable activities or whispering that people heard throughout the corridors, that will now turn into zero tolerance. And that is a good thing. Because I think there was probably um, a lot of willful ignorance going on at different in different environments because a lot of people had commented on behavior of some of the people um, who you named for a long time and I think people just didn't look too closely. Um, that ended um, with all the revelations uh, uh, of Harvey Weinstein and, and over the course of the last weeks. I'm curious when we talk about, and I spend so much of my time talking about partisan divide, talking about people who feel left out, who feel yeah. disenfranchised, how does that inform not just what you do on a personal level, but at HBO, choices you make over yeah. content in terms of thinking about are we representing across all of our choices the diversity of voices that yeah. are out there? So, you know, we were, HBO was privileged to win uh, a, an award for diversity a few weeks back from the Cates Foundation, and I was privileged enough to accept it, and I kind of threw away my formal acceptance, and I just said, you know, how is it possible, and I was here stealing from Skip Gates' wonderful show, uh, Finding Your Roots, where it's pretty clear his conclusions are that the human genome makes clear we're 99.9% .9 the same. And so I asked rhetorically, how is it possible if we're 99.9% .9 the same that there is so much toxicity, so much meanness, so much divisiveness and vitriol in our culture? How? And I answered by saying, I think because we don't see each other. We spend too much time thinking about, worrying about ourselves. And we're not listening to one another, which is the real art of good politics, is listening. Those of us who are privileged enough to have a role in, a uh, small role in popular culture, have an opportunity to tell stories which can help people see what different lives look like. Still be entertaining, still be engaged, doesn't need to be didactic, but you can do something that opens up people's eyes. If you take a show like Insecure, uh, Issa Rae's wonderful show about growing up African American in, in Los Angeles, she, she is opening a world up to people who previously probably had no idea what that felt like to be in that demographic, at this moment in history, and she's telling a story. And I think that's very important. Sonia So, who just did this wonderful documentary for us called Baltimore Rising, about the city's extraordinary resilience and grit in making their way back after the Freddie Gray uh, murder and the tragedy of that. And you see the dignity of the city in all its dimensions trying to find their voice and their equilibrium again. Those are things that, you know, we value. Look, we're, we're not, we're not, this is not, uh, we're not, we're not here to educate, right? We're here to entertain, and we're here, we are first and foremost an entertainment network. But in doing so, you can occasionally do something which is illuminating at the same time that it's entertaining. And because we have the privilege of having such a broad canvas to paint on, we have an opportunity to do that, and I think culture has a role to play. You're a young guy. <laughs> R relatively. Is there a next act for you? You know, i tell you something. I love my job. I love my company. I love my colleagues. Uh, I love coming in every day. Um, I have another uh, little maxim, which is usually people who are, who are good at what they do breathe what they do. I kind of breathe um, what, I, what I do. I, I'm never bored. Um, I consider it an enormous privilege. And I think every day I get up and say, okay, how can we do this better? How can we get this to the next level? Um, there's no complacency inside um, 
my office, and there's no complacency inside our company. We're always saying to ourselves, what's next? Um, how can we build this even uh, a little deeper, a little better? Um, what's our next big thing? And so when you have the opportunity to work with the range of people that I get to work with, both on the creative side and on the business side, um, I don't know that, that for me, um, that there are many things to do that are more exciting. So I'm loving this right now. I think, uh, you know, you think about full force what you're doing at any particular moment and you let the future take care of itself. Richard Pepler, CEO and Chairman of HBO, thank you so much for joining thank us. You.